Hello, this is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and today we're going to study Psalm 9. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins and that we are under the control of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity, the privilege we have to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 9 is categorized as a declarative Praise Psalm. This means the psalm has certain elements in it that can be identified in common with other elements of other psalms that are also called declarative praise psalms. Such things as you will see praise at the beginning of the psalm and often at the end. In between, there will be reasons for praising God, or the cause for praise. Now in this particular psalm, it's unusual in that towards the second half, you have a lament. So much lament that some have called this a lament psalm instead of a declarative praise psalm. Uh, there are other issues with categorizing this psalm, but we're not going to get into that. It's not that important. We'll just leave it as a declarative praise psalm. In verses 1 through 12, you will see the praise section. And then, beginning in verses 13 through 20, it'll move to a lament or prayer. But within that, you will also see some praise. The inscription tells us that David wrote it, but there's no evidence of when he wrote it. It's interesting, though, that he had this, it is set up so that it can be used in communal prayer or communal worship so that others can join with him in this psalm. Let's begin with the inscription. For the director of music, to the tune of Muth Laban, a psalm of David. You're probably wondering, what in the world is Muth Laban? Well, let me show you something that will probably be of little help. Let's look at some translations and what else they do with these same Hebrew terms. The Net Bible translates it according to the Alamoth Laban style. The NIV, the New King James, says, to the tune of the death of a son. New American Standard, on Muth Laban. King James, upon Muth Laban. They leave it as one word. Here's the issue. Let me show it to you in the Hebrew. You don't have to be a student of Hebrew to see this. In the ancient text, the letters originally were not separated. But when they decided to copy this so that we could read it easier, some read it as separated between the two words on the right. If you separate it there, you can get the literal translation to the death of a son. The word in the middle, muth, means death. And then laban would mean to a son. The first word means according to or to. Remember, Hebrew was read from right or left. However, if you keep the two terms together on the right, you can get uh, either Almuth Laban, put those two words together. I have them separated here for the example. Or you can have them uh, separated or unseparated, as I said. You, uh, here I have it uh, separated. But to say Almuth Laban in the inscription like this and not be clear 
leaves it open to, a different, to different interpretations. So what happens is the translators will just leave it, at least three of the five that we have up here, just leave it as it is in the transliteration, Muthlaban. Some believe this is actually a uh, term used for a certain way of singing or playing with instruments. For instance, uh, the women might just come in in the chorus by themselves. Uh, or the soft, soft singing, you might say. You might see that in a large church choir, but in other words, the the melody changes or the tune changes or those who sing, sing in a different way. But whatever the case, I just left it as open to the tune of Muth Laban, assuming it's probably some possible style of music. Verse 1, we begin the praise. The psalmist writes, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will recount all your wonders. The psalmist uses the word yada for praise. Let me show it to you in the Hebrew. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Hebrew on these words in this psalm because so many of them are simple and they're not big doctrinal issues. Yada in the Hifel perfect, it means I will cause. I will cause the action of praise. Then he says he will recount, meaning that he will uh, count or consider the uh, wonders that the Lord has done. And then the word for wonders, pala. It means wonders, or we could say wondrous acts, extraordinary acts, surpassing acts that the Lord has done. Verse 2, he continues his praise. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Now let me point out something here that's also in the language. Uh, you see the terms, I will. I will. We saw this in the uh, first verse also. I will praise you. I will recount. Now we have I will be glad. I will sing praise. These are called cohortatives. That means that the speaker has a strong desire to do this personally. So here we see David's strong desire to praise the Lord with all his heart. He's holding nothing back. He really wants to do this. I really want to recount the Lord's deeds, his deliverances, his judgments on the enemies, his blessings from God, the acts of God's goodness and mercy. We'll see this throughout the psalm. He praises the name, the person of the Lord, calling him the Most High. He is the Most High. He is the one above everything else. He is the one to praise. Already we see an early lesson in this psalm. One of the reasons we worship is to praise the Lord. This gives us reminders of what he has done in the past so we can expect his work for us in the future. Beginning in verse 3, the psalmist begins to speak of one of those wondrous acts of God pertaining to the judgment on the wicked. This actually goes to verse 6. Let's look at verses 3 and 4 first. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have defended my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. This says that when the enemy turn away, they find themselves dying right there before the Lord. And when this happens, the psalmist sees his righteous cause defended, knowing 
that the Lord judges righteously. Let's talk about some application here. Though these words seem to describe the battlefield, they at the same time have application for us. When our cause is just, the Lord will defend us and defeat the enemy. He always does the right thing, and that is something to remember. Injustice does not go unpunished. Righteousness does not go unrewarded. But it is in God's way and His timing that we must not forget. Sometimes when we forget that, we begin to lose our trust. Always keep in mind that in the sovereignty of God, it's also according to His time and the way He will do it. We may not see evildoers punished, but we learn that they go into eternal damnation. But on the other hand, there may be many times we see evildoers punished while here on earth. We continue with the Lord as righteous blood, as, as the Lord as the righteous judge. He tells what he does, the Lord does, to the nations and the wicked in verse 5. You have rebuked the nations, you have destroyed the wicked, you have wiped out their name forever and ever. Their rebuke and destruction is so thorough that their name disappears. That's a way of saying how complete their destruction is. Their names are wiped off the face of the earth. And there's more to it. Verse 6. The enemy has come to an end to permanent ruins and you have uprooted the cities. The memory of them has perished. If we think in terms of the ancient world when one city may have a, a ruler over it, and those cities perhaps attacked the armies of Israel, and then the Lord used Israel to wipe that city out. So here David is recalling battle experiences, wars and battles he's went through, he's aware of. And he recalls how the Lord will do these type of things. But at the same time, it anticipates that the Lord can do it again. So when you're facing enemy again, remember what the Lord has done in the past. Here we see that the enemy are permanently ended. <clears throat> Their cities are uprooted. That means they're not going to plant there anymore. Any memory of them is wiped out. Whatever fame they may have had is no more. Next, the psalmist shifts attention to the Lord so that we look at the Lord and what He is doing right now. Verse 7 and 8. But the Lord sits, meaning he rules or is enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. He judges the inhabited world in righteousness. He governs the people with equity. Now we saw in the previous verses back in 5 and 6 that the enemy were temporary. They would be wiped out. In contrast here, we see the permanence of the Lord's rule. The only thing permanent about the enemy is their disappearance of memory. As the eternal ruler of the universe, the Lord is just. He can be nothing but just. 
in verse 8, we have these parallel lines. Let me just put them up there by themselves. <clears throat> he judges the inhabited world in righteousness. He governs the peoples with equity. When I say parallel lines, we're basically saying the same thing in two different ways. Now, think of it. He judges the inhabited world in righteousness. He governs the peoples with equity or justice. This is the only way the Lord rules. And we've already been told that he is always ruling from his throne. Now listen, if you think the Lord does otherwise than the way this is stated, then that's an assumption that he has lost control. He can't do that. He's God. And only that, as God, he rules perfectly fair. Knowing these absolute truths about our Lord, that he judges with righteousness, he governs with equity, gives us a hope. That tells us that as his elect, as his children, as the people of God, we can go to our Father for safety and refuge. So what it comes down to is that we understand that God will always judge righteously. He'll always govern fairly. That doesn't mean that his own won't have many troubled times, and they do. In fact, that's the subject of many of the Psalms and much of even the New Testament writings of the troubles of believers. But that's all in God's overall plan. And we know from recent studies in the New Testament that's part of our testing and part of our spiritual growth. That confident hope, though, that we develop from knowing these truths, that we are his children, we should also know that in that blessed status as his own, verse 9, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of need. Let's work at the, look at this word stronghold. It's used twice in this one verse. The word is misgob. It means a secure height, an unassailable place that no one can reach, where you're safe and can't be harmed. It's a refuge. It's walls that can't be climbed over. It's unbreachable. It is a place where you're absolutely and totally secure. And this is for those who are oppressed. Short word, easy to remember. Doc, D-A-K. Literally, it means crushed. Figuratively, for us, it's the oppressed. It may be a reputation that's been oppressed or crushed or ruined, a life that seems to be ruined. But the Lord is our stronghold. He will take us in every time. He is said to be a stronghold in times of need. Let's look at that word. Of need. The word is Batzara. Literally, it means drought. Drought in the ancient world was devastating. It meant no food. It meant starvation. It meant death. Here it's used for desti destitution or need. A stronghold in times of need. Now, repeating the term stronghold enforces the idea that the Lord provides us a secure 
absolutely secure place. When we are oppressed by whatever the circumstances or people, the Lord is our complete and secure place. In times of severe need, the Lord is our place of safety and provision. The Psalms are something that we often read when we're perhaps troubled in heart. Do not forget this Psalm if you go through those future times of distress that will come upon the whole world. In verse 10, we see what the Lord does for those who know and trust Him. And those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, do not forsake those who seek you. The word for know is the common word we see in the Old Testament for know, yada, y-a-d-a. The word for trust, batak. Let's look at that for a moment. Batak. It's in the imperfect, meaning that the action is viewed as incomplete. In other words, it keeps, it keeps going. And those who know your name keep trusting. And then, what's interesting in the next line, for you, Lord, do not forsake. Now this word is in the perfect. What does that tell us? That tells us the action is complete. It doesn't tell us when, but the, the point of this is that it has more to do with the fact that the Lord does not forsake. And then we have again the participle of those who seek you. Darash. Keep this word in mind. We'll see it again in a moment. Darash. To inquire of or seek. Let's look at this verse again. And those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, do not forsake those who seek you. Those who know the name of the Lord are believers who keep trusting in the Lord. This is a constant abiding faith in the Lord, trusting Him for our needs, such as protection and safety, physical, financial, spiritual needs, including for those we love, our children, our husband or wife, our parents, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ. For anything and everything, we should trust in Him. It is the believer who trusts and keeps seeking the Lord, who knows the Lord, will not forsake him. There will be many times when we really do not know what is going on in our lives. We'll have such questions as, what is the Lord doing with us or doing with me? Why isn't this or that prayer answered positively? It seems it would be much better if it went this way. Why does it hurt so bad? Why do I have to go through this again? In these times when we have these questions, things may get very stressful. We are to remember that the Lord will not forsake us. He can't. We are His. He is always faithful. Remember, we are 
defeated from the New Testament, we, we learn, as adult sons. We are considered adult sons of God, children of God, adults. From the New Testament perspective, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Just because you don't have a lot of stuff or stuff you think you need or better stuff or new stuff, or maybe some of your stuff was wearing out. You still have the Lord. Oh, how much easier it would be if I had a better this or that. Be content with what you have. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. In verses 11 through 14, we look at the praise portion and then we move into the lament or prayer portion. 11 through 14. Now we saw in verses 1 and 2, uh, actually 3 and 4, we saw the psalmist speaking. Remember he used the first person singular, I, I praise, I recount, and so on. Then he tells of the wondrous acts of God towards both the wicked and the righteous. These are reasons for praise. Now in verse 11, he calls for others to sing praises to the Lord. This Lord who sits enthroned. Verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the people his deeds. This word for sing praise is a PL imperfect. It means to make music or, or sing praises from the word zamar. So here we learn that the Lord is the one who sets enthroned in Zion. Now, we see the Lord as enthroned in heaven today, and that's the way we should view it. But remember, to the ancient Israelite, Zion was the mountain upon which Jerusalem was built, and upon that was also the temple. So to the ancient Israelite, the Lord had a special presence among his people. First in the temple, at the Ark of the Covenant, then the, um, excuse us, first at the tabernacle, and then later, once the temple was built, again at the Ark of the Covenant that was in the temple. The second part of our verse says, Proclaim among the people his deeds. We are to tell others of what the Lord has done. That's part of our praise, is to tell others what the Lord has done. The Lord has kept me through these troubled times. I don't need that because I have the Lord. The Lord takes care of us during that storm. He will take care of us during the next storm. Verse 12. For he who avenges blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. This is an interesting verse and certainly changes the tone. For he who avenges blood, that refers to the Lord, of course. He avenges the blood of those who have been murdered or hurt, who have bled. Let's look at that word. We looked at it earlier. That's why I pointed it out. If you remember, we saw this in verse 10. The word was darash. We translated it seek. To inquire of. It was in verse 10 where it said, 
for you, Lord, do not forsake those who seek you. Now this same word, dirash, is applied to the Lord. In the context of him being <clears throat> in the context of him being an avenger. So to tie these two thoughts together, the Lord does not forsake those who seek him. And he, the Lord, seeks out to avenge those who wish to take life of those who seek him. So, in other words, if you seek the Lord and there are those who are out to get you, the Lord, the Lord will seek them like an avenger to protect you and provide refuge. The next line says, he does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Another word worth looking at for afflicted, ani, an adjective here. It means afflicted, the poor, the needy, the weak. Look at, let's look at these two verses together, 11 and 12. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. There are times we are to praise the Lord. The one who sits enthroned now in heaven. Though the nations or rulers may think they govern, it is only by God's permission and under his, under his sovereignty. Tell the people of his wonderful deeds. And this includes how he seeks out and avenges those who shed blood and wrong his people. Even though the avenging may seem too long delayed, the Lord does not forget the cry of the afflicted or the poor, the needy, the oppressed. In verse 13, the writer calls for help from the Lord personally. He shifts to a personal tone again when he says, Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death. The psalmist David now personally calls for help for the Lord's undeserved favor towards him. He tells the Lord to see. He, he actually commands the calimperative, ra'ah, word we often see in the Old Testament. It means to see. See my affliction. That's our word ani, this time a noun. It's the need. It's the oppression. It's the affliction. And then he says, You who lift me up from the gates of death. Well, the gates of death is an image of the psalmist about to die. He's at the gates of Sheol, the place where all the dead went in Old Testament times. The believer went to paradise. The unbeliever went to Hades. He says, You who lift me up from the gates of death. So the purpose of him being lifted up and away from those gates is in verse 14. That I may declare your praises, that is, his mighty acts, in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I'll rejoice in your deliverance. Here we see in the gates of daughter of Zion. That represents the city of Jerusalem itself. Notice there's a change of place. The Lord takes him from the gates of death to the gates of Jerusalem. Where the psalmist can say, I rejoice 
and your deliverance. So in our verse, we see the psalmist ask for personal assistance here. For the Lord to get him out of this near-death affliction. So the Lord can move him from the gates of death to the gates of Jerusalem. Take him back home where he belongs. Where he can praise the Lord and rejoice in his deliverance. Then add to that the judgment of the wicked in verses 15 through 18. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made, and the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. The word for sunk here, the cow perfect, taba, to sink or to sink down. The perfect means the action's complete. This has already happened, often translated in the past. The nations or peoples, that's the enemies, are described here as being caught up in their own machinations, their own traps, their own schemes. What they sought to destroy with or trap is now trapping and destroying them. They've caught their foot in their own net. Verse 16. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his hands, the wicked is snared. Now if you have a different translation in that last line, I'll explain why. The last line, in the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. Notice, in the work of his own hands, refers to the Lord, his hands. Oh, excuse me, I'm, that's wrong. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. In other words, the wicked snares himself. Actually, I said that wrong again. <laughs> And the work of his own hands, that would refer to the Lord. The wicked is snared. Now, let me get this translation up here for you, the one I just said. You see that in the New American Standard and the New King James. And that's because of the pointing of the Hebrew. You have it two different ways. You'll notice the difference. You'll look below the letters. You'll see the vowel points are different. One is like a dash on the right. The one on the left, you have the two dots. The other one translated like this. By the work of their own hands, the wicked are ensnared. I'll attempt to explain this, though I'm not sure whether this always helps. But the net translators say this form of the particular word that we have in the previous translation is what they call unattested. This means this form of the word cannot be shown to exist elsewhere. So they're assuming that it doesn't exist because it's not somewhere else in Scripture. But then to do that makes the his of the first view a collective use and so they translate it their own hands rather than his. But as you can see, it turns the meaning around from the Lord doing the snaring to the wicked doing it to themselves. Now you might want to go over this again, but understand you have the choice. Let me put them both up there between these two translations. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. That is the Lord doing the work. The second has them doing it to themselves. The wicked are ensnared. Now, one other point of interpretation. The top interpretation agrees with the first two lines of this verse, with the Lord doing it. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his hands, the wicked is snared. 
the net agrees with interpretation that they do it to themselves, which is what it says in verse 15, the previous verse. So you can see where there's possibilities for either one. And that's why you have such a difference of translations. I go with the previous one, the New American Standard, or the New King James, because it makes perfectly good sense as it is without changing anything. Then you have this phrase, Higion, or Higion. I'll put that on the board. It's another one of those terms. You're not for sure what it means. Is it an instrument that just plays in quietness as the singing stops? Is it a manner of singing? We don't know. To sum up this verse, the Lord appears, he executes judgment, the wicked are snared. That's what we need to know. The Lord appears, he executes judgment, the wicked are snared. In verses 17 and 18, we see how things will turn out in the end. For the wicked, verse 17, the wicked will turn to Sheol, even all the nations who forget God. This is a little awkward in trying to get this out of the Hebrew, but we get the point. This is the end of the wicked and the nations or peoples who ignore and forget God. They are bound for Sheol. That is the direction they are going. They are bound to death. They are bound to the section called Hades. And that includes even the nations who forget God, who ignore God, who have no place for God in their lives. And now for the needy, verse 18. For the needy are not permanently forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Let's look at the word for afflicted again. Ani, we've seen it before. The poor, the needy, the weak. Here we see another contrast between the nations who forget God and the fact that the afflicted are not, are not permanently forgotten. Now this way of putting it, are not permanently forgotten, as a way of saying it may appear that God is not working at some time, but they are not forgotten. God may let his people go through a long time of discipline slash training for he is growing them up to be the people he wants them to be. God will remember the needy, the afflicted, the poor. Neither is their hope gone. There's no reason for them to ever lose hope. It is the wicked and nations who do the afflicting that will perish. Not the hope of the afflicted. Here is where we see trust in the Lord. See its end fruit. In other words, we see the results of continuing to trust in the Lord, knowing that He's in control, He'll work it out at His time and His way. There will come a time when the Lord will deal out retribution to the wicked and bring relief to the afflicted. In the last two verses, we have hope in God's just rule. In verse 19, the psalmist calls for the Lord to act right now when he says, Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. 
Let the nations be judged before you or in your presence. The phrase, Arise, O Lord, means act now. Do not let man prevail. The word for prevail, Azaz, it means to be strong or prevail. Let the nations be judged before you in your presence. You see, the psalmist is causing, calling for instant action now. Verse 20. Listen to this one. Terrify them, Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. Selah. Literally, terrify them, Lord, is put, O Lord, fear to them. To terrify them is to say, well, the psalmist is saying, put them in a complete state of hopelessness and helplessness. They realize that their doom is unstoppable. It is coming upon them this is unconsolable terror. It doesn't lessen. If anything, it gets worse. This is when the human being realizes his mere mortality. How thin that string is between life and death. And that the Lord is about to take them down. Literally, to Hades. The psalmist calls for this to be such a reality to them that they're terrified. To fear the Lord and what he can do. Then he says, let the nations know they are but mere men. The Lord is to let them know that they are just men, mortal creatures capable of death not able to even begin to contest with the Lord over his people. So what do we see in so much of this psalm? We see the psalmist calling for the Lord to act towards those who are afflicting his own. Let's look at verse 19 and 20 once more. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Terrify them, Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. Selah. Well, Father, we thank you for this psalm that has great meaning for those of us who have to deal with circumstances and people sometimes every day where we have to work through things that are unpleasant where we are not only in need but oppressed challenge us with these words knowing that you set enthroned and that you are always just, that you are always righteous, and that you are always fair. But there are many times when we have to wait. Lord, give us strength in these times. Help us recall these words and apply these principles of your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.